Dear panelists, dear emin eminent members of this jury, dear audience, the few hours we are going to spend together during this beautiful Saturday afternoon under the one and only sun of England mark the saddening yet exciting and wonderful conclusion of the RS Mutin Competition 2021. Don't worry, we already know that this Zoom session is the highlight of your day, week, lockdowns, and probably life, actually. Even though that I, that even though that I hope that you well know this competition, let me summarize it a bit for you and for the members of this public that didn't cross path with our multiple and spamming posts on both Instagram and LinkedIn. The Oras Mutin competition is the brand new and exciting French and English law mutin competition, which is open to every first and second year law student studying a double degree in French and English law. This moot uh, court is organized by the Essex Board of the Association du Double Diplôme Essex France and in partnership with the Association des Juristes Queen Marie Sorbonne and the Franco British Lawyer Society. We already had the chance to hear pleas from participants coming from different universities and double degrees, uh, coming from all around France and the UK. They all fiercely competed with one another in semifinals on topic of both French constitutional law and French private law but a choice had to be made and only four contestants had earned a place in this wonderful final. During this final, you will have the greatest pleasure to hear pleas on both English contract law and English criminal law. If you wish to take these last few minutes to read the topics, they are available on Moodle, <laughs> oh, sorry, Fourth of Habits, on all social media accounts, even though we are sincerely, we sincerely, we are sincerely understand that listening to a plea without any knowledge of the case is pleasing. Oh, I see all of you right now, and believe me, I understand. The wait must be unbearable. You must be wondering, who are these brilliant finalists honoring the term girl power? Well, let me keep the suspense alive. You will find out about them in due course. I guess I can only tell you that they come from the University of Essex, Queen Mary University, Bangor University, and that they are affiliated with the very prestigious French universities of Lyon 3, La Sorbonne, and Toulouse Capital. To judge these brilliant and exceptional finalists, we can only count on an exceptional, and, uh, and an exceptional jury composed of eminent professionals, leaders in their fields. It is my greatest honor and pleasure to introduce you to them. Please welcome them with, the, with your warmest applause. Let me start by mentioning, mentioning the first member of our honorable, honorable panel, former pra practicing lawyer, author of numerous articles, honorary professor and honorary doctors of law at Glasgow University, president of the Franco-British Lawyer Society. He was appointed Queen's Council and Bencher Middle Temple. Nominated by the UK in 2015 and until 2020 due to the infamous Brexit, he was a member of the prestigious General Court of the Court of Justice of the Europe European Union and sat on cases touching trademarks competition, terrorist assets freezes, agricultural subsidies, state aids, public procurement, and civil service disputes. Please welcome Mr. Ian Forrester, QC LLD. Let's move on to our second member of our honorable jury, former advocate deputy and standing junior to the Department of Energy. She was also appointed Queen's Counsel before being appointed judge of the Supreme Court. Now, she's now Lord Justice Clerk, President of the Second Division of the Court of Session and Chair of the Scottish Seten Sentencing Council. Please uh, welcome the Right Honourable Lady Dorian. As we say it in French, we have never two without three. Former lawyer in Paris and London, Professor in, at Law at, and Vice President of International Relations uh, at the University of Toulouse Capital, Founder of the Toulouse European School of Law, she became judge at the French private law Supreme Court, the Cour de Cassation, in the commercial chamber specializing in EU competition law and EU private international law. Please welcome Mrs. Sylvian poyot -Pelzetto. Let me now introduce you to a fourth member of our honorable jury, 
lecturer and module, module leader in English and comparative contract law at the Paris Dauphin International University, president of the Fédération des Associations Françaises en Grande-Bretagne. He is also qualified as a barrister in England and in Wales, as a French lawyer at the Paris Bar, and as a registered legal practitioner with full rights of audience before the Dubai International Financial Center Courts. Please welcome Maître Jean-François Le Guerre. And last but not least, let me introduce you to a fifth member of our jury. Academic Director at the Franco-British Lawyer Society, Professor at Law at the, uh, the Sorbonne University and founder of the Sorbonne's Common Law DU. She is part of the examining board uh, for student exchanges with partner universities. She also sits on the Comité Scientifique of the Sorbonne Law, uh, Law Review and teaches at the École Française du Barreau in Paris, as well as being a member of the examining board of, uh, for the CAPA. Please welcome doc uh, Dr. Vivian Forest. As you may have noticed, our finalists will have to compete against, uh, against each other and uh, against each other tooth and nails to convince our jury of experts. Before starting anything, let me remind you quickly the rules of this, of this final. Our finalists will have to defend their clients during a maximum of 10 minutes. Then they will each have uh, two minutes of Q&A with our jury. The time will be counted and they will be cut if they exceed the time allocated. The audience, although silent because it is muted and has no camera on, will have its part to play in all of this. Your benevolent applause are more than welcome. So yeah, I have finished lecturing you. I mean, for now. Now it is time for advocacy. Here, he, here we are. Here's the final of this competition. Don't worry. I know, uh, I know the contestants and, we, and you will surely love their themes. To start, I'd like to call to the stand, uh, to the virtual stand, uh, Mrs. Nicoleta Constantello, uh, Queen Mary representative and senior appellant for uh, Huang Feng, and Mrs. Uh, Lisa Gesnek, Bengal representative and senior respondent for Lyran Stores. Uh, so uh, Mrs. Constantello, you have 10 minutes to convince, to convince us. May it please the court, Your Excellencies. Good afternoon. My name is Nicolas Cosintello and I represent the appellant, Mrs. Huang Feng, here at the Civil Division of the Court of Appeal in the case of Feng and Lyron Stores Limited of 2021. Before I begin with my submission, would Your Excellencies like a brief summary of the facts of the case? Um, okay, everyone's good, that's perfect. All right. So, our appeal will focus on four principal grounds. Firstly, we will focus on how the sign of the window of Lyron stores is not an invitation to treat, since its specificity and detailed nature are differentiated from the authority case of Grange and Son and Gough. Secondly, we will prove that the notice from the unilateral contract, which the appellant validly accepted through her performance, through the illustration of both Carlyle and Carbolic Small Book Company and Errington and Wood. Thirdly, through the case of Dolia and four milk bank nominees, we shall analyze why the offer could not have been withdrawn once acceptance had already commenced by Ms. Feng. Lastly, through the use of the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations of, uh, Act of 2008 and the parallelism of our facts with the cases of Bowerman and British travel agents, as well as the uh, Crown and Warwickshire County Council, which shall illustrate the judicial and statutory tendency of English law to validate notice related to unilateral contracts and to prevent client misinformation, especially in a business to consumer context. Your Excellencies, I would first like to draw your attention to page four of the bundle and specifically to the case of Granger and Son and Goff. Uh, would your lordships and ladyships like a brief summary of the facts of this particular case? Um, yes, please. Absolutely. So uh, Granger and Son, they circulated a price list catalog for their wine products. Uh, Gulf ordered wines from the catalog and when uh, Granger and Son, when they refused to deliver them at the stated price, um, um, this, those particular products in the catalog, um, they refused. So essentially they wanted to prove contact, uh, contract formation. The House of Lords in this case held that this specific catalog was an invitation to treat 
and thus uh, it does not create a contract between the parties of the case as if there was a valid offer in place a granger and son would not technically be allowed to uh, run out of stock and lord herschel as part of the ratio of the case clarified that the mere transition of a price list does not amount to an offer because if it did so then the wine or the product in question uh, would not be allowed to, to run out of stock so in our case, the sign of Lyron stores cannot be regarded as an informational store catalog, as firstly, it concerns one particular laptop, not just any computer. The notice read this brilliant laptop. In addition, it does not solemnly include the price of the computer in question, which would have been uh, satisfying the grand jury and golf criteria, but it also provides for the winter sale context the competitive price reduction and all the relevant conditions including the exact date and time frame of acceptance of the contract in fact this detailed and informative elements of the notice that precise the conditions of the contract should be emphasized it was this lack of detail that played a significant role in Partridge and Crittenden, a similar case as well uh, on page five of the bundle, since it was a lack of detail regarding the context of the sales that distinguished invitations to treat from prosecutable offers. So having established the difference between an invitation to treat and an offer, let us turn to page six of the bundle to look at Carl Lill and Parabolic Smoke, Smoke Ball Company. So Lord Justice Bowen, he says the criteria uh, of contractual vagueness, clarity, and specificity by stating that the contract was not too vague to be enforced because it can be interpreted according to what ordinary people would understand by it. Lord Justice Bowen specifically, um, specifically made clear that it is up to anyone who strives to come forward and perform the condition on the faith of the advertisement. His words successfully encapsulate the series of events present in our fact pattern and illustrate how unilateral contractual offers ought to be validated upon two key factors, the intention of the parties and the offeree's performance. Another issue his lordship touched upon was the illustration of satisfactory performance and how crucial that is. The relevance of this issue regarding performance and diligence on the conditions is super important since our client, having seen the notice on Monday, with the precise wording, I remind you this is 8 a.m., got up very early on Wednesday morning and arrived outside the shop at 6 a.m. in order to ensure that she would be indeed the first client queuing to walk through the doors. Her respect and diligent following of the conditions are also reflected in her preparation. She did have 100 pounds in cash with her. Lord Justice Bound also addresses the failure of notification, uh, which is most likely to be uh, mentioned by a learned friend. He said that it's not necessary for the offeree, in our case, Ms. Feng, to follow the indicated method. Um, to, to, it, is, it is necessary for the offeree to follow the indicated method of acceptance if the offeror, in our case, um, Lyron Stores, expressly or impliedly intimates in his offer that it will be sufficient to act on the proposal, then there is no need for um, notification. So Lyron Stores ought to be aware of the implication their offer imposed upon any member of the public. Having satisfied the unilateral offer guidelines, permit me, Your Excellencies, to emphasize on performance and conduct as uh, the third part of my submission, um, specifically on their thorough nature here in our case. On page nine of your bundles, you will find the key ratio of Lord Justice Denning uh, in Arrington and Woods. Uh, as for, for that case, for Arrington and Wood, would your Lordships like to hear a brief summary as to what the case was about? Yes, please. Absolutely. So a father-in-law uh, bought a house for his son and his son's wife. It was registered in his name. After paying the house deposit himself, the father that is, uh, he promised the couple he would transfer the title to them if they continued to pay the mor mortgage installments. After the father passed away and the title was transferred to the mother, the son went to live with um, his mother and the wife wanted to claim the house because she paid the mortgage installments through her performance. Um, so the court um, supported her, supported this particular claim, and specifically, um, Lord Justice Denning said, once the party embarks upon the actual performance, then the contract ought to be binding, even if conduct is left incomplete or underperformed. And this, uh, Your Excellencies, reflects our facts pattern effectively, since Ms. Feng had already followed several steps mentioned uh, by our counsel above in order to validly accept the offer. Now I would like to turn you, your attention to page 10 of the bundle. This is the case of Dolia and four male bank nominees. 
The case and specifically Lord Justice Gulf said that there is an implied obligation on the part of the offeror to not prevent the condition from being satisfied. So, and this is an obligation that arises as soon as the offeree starts to perform. Your Excellency, this is beyond insightful ratio dissidenti. It forms an essential part of unilateral uh, contract case law and it forms a distinct parallel with uh, our case since Lyron Stores should have up upheld their initial offer and respect their implied duty to validly accept the performance of a client. Lord Justice Goff also said that, you know, the, the defendants in the Dolly case, um, it was promised to them that the contract would be completed if they showed up at a specific time and place and if they deposited, and if they deposited a, um, a sum of money. So they did that and uh, he said that, you know, it's, it's a specific, specific performance that does validate the contract, and that is illustrated in the last paragraph of page 11, where he said that, you know, even though contracts were never actually exchanged, just how, just exa in exactly the same manner that Miss Feng never walked through the doors, it said that that's not important, since um, it's only, it can only be regarded as something complementary when it comes to performance. And other, so I would like to point your attention to those specific uh, first moves and actions taken by Ms. Fang. And lastly, if we were to look at page 12 of the bundle, this is Crown and Warwickshire County Council. So this is very similar to our case, Your Excellencies. It was, it was a, uh, a notice put up by a shop similar to the one in nature um, to, to lie on stores to beat any TV and any video price by 20 pounds on the spot. So this is very similar. And what uh, Lord Justice Roscoe said, he said that this is a continuing offer and to hold otherwise would be seriously to restrict the efficacy of consumer protection legislation. So this strict approach was uh, also affirmed a few years later in the case of Bowerman and Association of British Travel Agents, which can be found on page 13 of your bundle. This case concerned how the defendant's reimbursement notice that was, on the, that was displayed on their windows it created a unilateral contract. Most importantly, it was Lord Justice Waits in Hop House that evoked the objective test that I firstly mentioned when I analyzed the Carlyle case. And they said that in, when it comes to courts, such notices should be interpreted the same way a member of the public would reasonably read them. Um, so this acknowledgement of the disadvantaged position of a mere customer against a business is also reflected in the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations Act of 2008. This particular act, Your Excellency, has covered the, the scope of liability and offences for misleading notices and advertisements. Therefore, I strongly urge your lordships and ladyships to consider this no tolerance approach the UK legislative and judiciary branches have adopted towards such commercial practices with inherently unfair bargaining powers and thus allow. Thank you very much. Opinion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Constantelou. Uh, now we will hear uh, Mrs. Uh, Gesnek, uh, senior respondent for uh, Lyran Stores. You will have 10 minutes to convince us. Uh, can my you lords and lady, as has already been stated, my name is Lisa Gesnek. I am arguing for Lyran's ground in response to the appellant in the instant case. I will deal with two submissions. The first one, there was no contract between one thing and Lyran Stores because the notice in the shop window was not an offer, but an invitation to treat. And the second one, even if the notice did amount to an offer, it was withdrawn before it could be validly accepted. First and foremost, and I know this is not usual, but let me tell you a story. It concerns two parties, Miss One Thing and Lionsers. Obviously, this is not a fairy tale that neither bad nor nice people, only two men, good by nature, but corrupted by society, as Rousseau used to say. This story takes place in winter, more precisely at the approach of the annual sales. With this in mind, my client, like any shop worthy of the name, was seeking to attract customers by offering tempting discounts. So, he displayed a laptop in his window with a notice announcing for the first customer a 90% discount on this little gem of technology. However, and this is an important fact in the case since everything is a question of timing here, 30 minutes before the opening of the store and therefore before the entry of the first customer, one of the shop assistants replaced the notice, announcing no longer an insane reduction of 90% but now of 50 persons, which I think you will agree is still a substantial discount for a laptop. 
as you know, and happy that my client refused to sell her the aforesaid computer for the first outdated same offered, one thing sued Lion Stores for breach of contract. Obviously, Judge Abagan rejected the request following reasoning, which is also mine. If it pleases your lordship and ladyships, I will begin with my first submission. That is to say the fact that there is no contract between the two parties. As I insist on this point, it wasn't an offer, but well and truly an invitation to treat. It is primordial to lay the foundation for this submission. With this aim in mind, I am going to define these two terms to be as clear as possible. On the one hand, we find the offer defined by G-Trail in the law of contracts as an expression of willingness to contract on specified term made with the intention that it is to be combining as soon as it is accepted by the person to whom it is addressed. While on the other hand, we find the invitation to treat where the willingness is not to contract, but to negotiate. It is a central tenet in contract law that offers have to be distinguished from invitation to treat. Being invited to make an offer is fundamentally different from being made one. So here, if we asked ourselves a Shakespearean question, is it or is it not an invitation to treat? Let me explain to you with the help of previous court decision why in this case, the notice was not an offer at all. Goods on display in a shop window are an invitation to treat since the seller should be entitled to refuse to sell his goods. The bone of contention here being the laptop to a prospective buyer, miss one thing. This was the ratio decidendi of two previous important court decisions. The first significant ruling was in the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain versus Boots Chemist case, where the Court of Appeal concluded that the display of the goods on the shelf was not an offer. This analysis was supported by the fact that the customer would have been free to return any of the items to the shelf before payment had been made. Then we have the Fisher versus Bell case where Lord Parker CJ stated that the display of an article with a price on it in a shop window is an invitation to treat. How could be this more clear? That is why the laptop displayed in a window was an invitation to treat. And because of the stare decisis, we are bound to stand by what has been decided and not unsettledly established. Notwithstanding, I understand the fact that we could consider the notice not only as a display, but also as an advertisement, such as it is defined in section 336.1 of the Town and Country Planning Act of 1990, seen as a notice employed wholly for the purposes of announcement. But if we take this into account, advertisements are also considered as invitation to treat and not yet offers. This is established by the leading case on this matter. Partridge versus Crittenden, where the Judah of the Queen's Band Division held an advertising an advertisement to be an invitation to treat. In that, if we treated advertisement as offers, the advertiser might find himself contractually obliged to sell more goods than he owned. Nevertheless, a limit to this is set in the Carlisle versus Cabolic Smoke Ball Company case where the discussion was about the advertising gimmick, more specifically, if the advertiser has committed a sincerity. Contrary to that particular case, where the defendant made a promise, in our case, we noticed the lack of promise on the part of my client. 
in this matter. Once again, this is wholeheartedly in line with the fact that the notice cannot be equated with an offer. If your lordships and ladyship have no further question, I will now move to my second submission. Let me explain to you why, if the notice did amount to an offer, it was withdrawn before it could be validly accepted. For this submission, it falls to me to remind everyone about the two initial steps of a contract, offer and acceptance. I've already defined the first step, so I will now focus on the second one, that may be described as the unconditional assent communicated by the offeree and the offerer to all the time of the offer, given with the intention of accepting them all. This means that the two parties to a contract have to agree on all the terms. As a general rule, acceptance will not be effective unless communicated by the offeree. Here, the first offer was not properly accepted by the two parties, as Ms. One Thing did not communicate a wish to buy the laptop at £100 before the price was changed. And because of the withdrawal, the offer was no longer valid. To justify this, I propose a journey to the past. Let us go back to the Victorian era in 1840, in the famous case Hyde versus French, the court dismissed the claim and held that there was no binding contract as the original offer was no longer available or on the table, and that it had been replaced by a new one, which was the only valid one. We can clearly see the parallels between that case and the one before us today, and so, since a contract for the sale of good is a contract by which the seller transfers or agrees to transfer the property in good to a buyer for money consideration, according to the Sale of Good Acts 1979, there is no agreement here between my client and this one thing. There is no contract and therefore no breach of contract. My lord and lady, it is for this reason that I urge you to disallow the appeal. If your lordship and ladyship of no further question, but conclude, conclude the case for the respondent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Gesnick. Um, do our honorable jury has question for uh, Mrs. Constantelou? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you refer in your bundle to the consumer protection regulations, uh, and I'm not clear which of your arguments those regulations were meant to relate to. Absolutely. So permit me uh, to further enlighten you on this particular point. So my use of this particular uh, act, where it was used on the uh, Crown and Warwickshire uh, County Council case, um, I'm not using it particularly um, as a specific to use a particular clause. Um, it is it is a valid point that you've raised. Um, I'm still um, our council aims to prove a specific tendency by the legislative br branch to adopt this no tolerance approach of um, regarding specific misleading practices. In our case, it wouldn't be effectively used uh, because the shop assistant uh, was the one to change the sign and not the managing owner. Um, but still, the, the, the main focus point of this case is to prove that indeed the legislative branch has taken uh, some noticeable steps to prevent um, the mistreatment of consumers in, with unfair bargaining powers against businesses and shops. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Boyo Perdetto has a question. Go ahead. Um, so I heard that uh, it does exist uh, um, international convention uh, on uh, contract on international sales of goods. 
do you have any idea with, uh, what would be the uh, solution in relation to uh, this specific uh, issue? Mm -hmm. So if I've understood correctly, your ladyship asks the con if uh, such uh, international law piece of legislation would be used uh, in our case, is this uh, to make sure? Okay, thank you so much. So um, since we've got uh, the jurisdiction, the, the English law jurisdiction, that's why our submission primarily focused on, on case law. But since, you know, if we were to look at um, at this particular tendency in this trends that I've been uh, that I've mentioned in the cases, I believe that uh, an English court uh, would find substantial arguments and substantial grounds to allow the appeal and to hold the uh, creation of a unilateral contract. On a more international basis, um, uh, this I, I'm not sure if there is a, a particular connection uh, with our case. I would, um, if I were the leading. Um, appellant in this particular case, I would certainly look at uh, unfair treatment on behalf of co customers and not uh, on a more general broad perspective sales of goods. So um, that's what I would, uh, that's what I would answer to that personally, and I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. Um, so we have time for one question, and that will be the last. Uh, I see that Mr. Forrester has a question. Yes, I'd like to ask a question to Ms. Gizanek. Um, you assert that your client's employee withdrew, effectively withdrew the offer before um, the customer could uh, accept it. Now, what would your position be if just one minute before opening, the shop assistant had changed the notice. Uh, I'll thank you, your lordship, for having raised this point, that point, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it will be the same because uh, the fact that she doesn't accept the offer means that Excuse me, I'm a little bit curious. <laughs> yes, the fact that she doesn't accept the offer and that the offer had been replaced, this means that it's the new offer that counts, not the, the former one. And uh, that's it, I think. Sorry. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you very um, much. Until... Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so does uh, the jury has another question for Mrs. Gesnek? That would be the last question. If... No? I have one. Yeah. On the question of whether something is an offer or an invitation to treat, does that question not hinge on the wording used rather than whether the sign should be categorised as a notice or an advertisement? Uh... I agree with you on that point. Yes, the wording are important, but here, uh, in this case, the wording was clearly in, well, the wording, sorry, my cat. Uh, the wording say that it is an invitation to treat and not an offer because there was no promise, like I said. It was only uh, um, publicity, like, uh, yes, it's like, um, it was only to attract customer, but there was no promise. And uh, that's it, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Does that? You, you said that the the offer was an insane reduction. Is your client's position that it was a mistake? I don't think it's a mistake. It was only to attract. And we have to remember that my clients have to support his sale people who lives on the store turnover. So it was to attract, it was not a mistake, it was on purpose to attract. 
Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so the time is up for question. Thank you very much, your lordships and leaderships. So now we will move on to the second year law students. I would like to call to the stand, the virtual stand, um, Mrs. Uh, Clara Pria, Essex representative, and she will uh, prosecute on behalf of the Crown, the defendant, uh, Roni uh, Bonanno. And I will also like to call to the stand uh, Mrs. Julie Ramundu, uh, Bengal representative, and she will defend the interests of the defendant, Ro Roni Bonanno. Uh, so, uh, Clara Pria, you will have now 10 minutes to convince us. May it please your lordships. Good afternoon. My name is Ms. Clara Priya, and I appear on behalf of the prosecution in this case. Ms. Julia Ramondou appears on behalf of the defense. In order to briefly summarize the prosecution's case, Mr. Franco Freezer, an unidentified gunman, met with Mr. Kundel and the Bloodbegam Favre to have a discussion over previous incidents between their respective criminal organizations. As a consequence of which, Mr. Kundel was regrettably shot dead. Mr. Freezer and the unidentified gunman drove away. The following day, the sidecar which had been previously stolen was set on fire. By virtue of the evidence and what follows, it is respectfully submitted that Mr. Bunagan is the unidentified gunman in this case. Your lordships will note that the defendant has been charged with two offenses. Your lordships, if I may now commence with the first charge, that of conspiracy to murder. Pursuant to section one, subsection one of the Criminal Law 1977, a conspiracy to murder, as this court will be well aware, is when two or more people agree to a course of action that will result in the unlawful killing of another person. Firstly, it is respectfully submitted that the agreement is the most important aspect. The defense may well argue that the agreement is missing, as, as we are not told about any written or oral agreement. Nevertheless, the agreement does not require contractual formalities, but only a decision to pursue the criminal course of conduct. We can distinguish a case from Walker in 1962, where the defendant's conviction for conspiracy to murder was quashed as the matter consisted purely of negotiation. Whereas in our case, the clear existence of an agreement between Mr. Benaglio and Mr. Freezer can be readily inferred from the concerted action. They drove together to the Blind Mega Tavern, where they freely and voluntarily agreed to shoot Mr. Cornell. Mr. Bonanno's presence at the time of the incident indicates that he, on his co-conspirator, had previously agreed to the conspiracy to murder Mr. Cornell. Moreover, may I remind your lordships that Mr. Freezer pleaded guilty to the conspiracy to murder. Mr. Bonanno's co-conspirator previously recognized that there was an agreement to murder Mr. Cornell. Your Lordships, the Crown submits that it is abundantly sufficient to prove that an agreement had been reached between Mr. Freeze and Mr. Bunani. According to the case of Hassan Bali and Bali of 2002, once the agreement is established, there is no need to go beyond this to show that Mr. Bunani had begun any further preparation towards committing the offense. This agreement, Your Lordships, is sufficient. Moving on to the mens rea, the sole requirement is that the defendant must intend to form the agreement according to the case of prior of 2004. It is the intention which is the key. It is clear from section one, subsection one of the criminal law 1977 that Mr. Bernardo and Mr. Friso must have intended for the agreement to be carried in accordance with the intentions at the point they formed the agreement according to the case of Tuk Tuk Chung of 1995. And both Mr. Freezer and Mr. Bonanno had the intention to murder Mr. Cornell when they drove to meet him armed with a gun. Mr. Bonanno is a member of the new firm who had a previous incident with Mr. Cornell organization. It is submitted that Mr. Bonanno wanted to take revenge he intended to form the agreement to murder Mr. Cornell. Your Lordships, respectfully, it is clear that we're talking about criminal organizations. This court ought not to be blind or naive. Mr. Bonanno perfectly knew what he was doing with his co-conspirator. In the event you were reluctant to recognize that Mr. Bonanno intended to carry out the agreement, section one, subsection two of the criminal law addresses mens rea as to circumstances directly. 
In the case of Anderson of 1986, Lord Bridge stated that the accused must only intend to play some part in the agreed course of conduct. I quote, nothing less will suffice, nothing more is required. Mr. Bernardo, being the gunman, he definitely intended to play a role in the conspiracy to murder Mr. Cornell. Your Lordships, it is the Crown's case that the requirements for the actress and the murder of conspiracy to murder are fulfilled. There is no defense as Mr. Bonanno did commit the alleged act and was not acting under duress. Therefore, the Crown is able to prove that Mr. Bonanno is liable for conspiracy to murder. And it's beyond all doubt, all reasonable doubt. Mr. Bonanno must therefore be sentenced to imprisonment for life, according to Section 3, Subsection 2A of the Criminal Law Act 1977. Your Lordships, if the Crown may now move to the second charge, the defendant's participation in the activities of an organized crime group. The defendant's criminality in this matter did not solely lead to a charge of conspiracy to murder. Indeed, the defendant was starving for criminal activities. Section 45, Subsection 1 of the Serious Crime Act 2015 states that a person who participates in the criminal activities of an organized crime group commits an offense. The prosecution will demonstrate that Mr. Bernardo was involved in two criminal activities of the new firm, the theft on arson of a cycle. Firstly, for the actus res, the crucial proof that Mr. Bernardo actually took part in both activities. This is quite straightforward, given the overwhelming evidence. Regarding the theft, the sidecar previously stolen was abandoned near Mr. Bernardo's house. The crime's witness is the owner of the sidecar who recognized Mr. Bernardo in the commission of the act. And Mr. Bernardo's fingerprints were found on the remains of the sidecar. Regarding the arson, the day after the sidecar was used, it was set on fire with gasoline. Again, Mr. Bonanno's fingerprints were found in the gasoline tanks left next to the cycle. The defense may well argue that the evidence is insufficient, but respectfully, your lordships, taking into consideration all of these factors, they leave no room for mere coincidence, but instead prove Mr. Bonanno's participation. Section 7 of the Theft Act 1968 and Section 4 of the Criminal Damage Act 1971 states that theft and arson are punishable with imprisonment for a minimum term of seven years. Mr. Bonanno, member of the new firm, deprives the owner of his property before setting a fire for his own benefit. Therefore, according to Section 45, Section 3, 4, and 6 of the Serious Crime Act, the theft and arson of the cycle in which Mr. Bonanno took part are criminal activities of an organized crime group. The actus res is accordingly established. Moving on to the mens rea, it has been proved that there are reasonable grounds to believe that when stealing or setting the site on fire to destroy evidence of both his and the new firm's liabilities, Mr. Bonanno knew, or at least he reasonably suspected that he was taking part in the new firm's, new firm's criminal activities. According to section 45, subsection two, the mens rea is established Again, there is no defense as section 45, subsection 8 does not apply. Your Lordships, in order to bring my submissions to a close, I respectfully invite this court to consider the drastic and dangerous inevitable consequences should the defendant, Mr. Bernani, not be convicted. Mr. Cornell is dead, dead as a result of the conspiracy committed by the defendant, letting Mr. Bernano walk free would be a significant danger to society and a free pass for the members. Mr. Bonanno and Mr. Friedman are dangerous individuals. Your Lordships, the Crown submits that it has overwhelmingly proved that Mr. Bonanno is liable for both the offense of conspiracy to murder and the offense of participation in the activities of an organized crime group. I respectfully urge you to convict Mr. Rooney Bonanno, and should you do so, sentence him to imprisonment for life. Your Lordships, that concludes my submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Clara Pria. Um, Mrs. Ramondou, 
uh, you are now going to be defend. Uh, you are now going to defend the interest of uh, Mr. Onano. You'll have uh, ten minutes to convince us. Honorable members of the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, good afternoon. I am before you today as counsel for the defense. As you may have understood, my client, Ronnie Bonanno, has been charged by the CPS with conspiracy to murder and participation in the activities of an organized crime group. But what happened? As a matter of fact, we know that two members of an organized crime group called the New Firm shot dead a member of another organization, fled the crime scene, and abandoned their vehicle, which was a sidecar, near my client's house. The following day, the sidecar was set on fire with gasoline. Out of the two criminals, one remains unidentified, the gunman. So here we are. The CPS wants to find and punish this gunman, which is perfectly laudable. What is not laudable, however, is to incriminate someone like my client without any evidence linking him directly to the crimes at issue. So he the so prosecution is putting forward the fact that the sidecar in question was actually a stolen one and its owner recognized the banana as a thief. Well, fair enough. My client may be guilty, yet of nothing but a theft. The prosecution then highlights the fact that the police found my client's fingerprints on the vehicle. Well, that is logical. I mean, if he stole it, it was probably in order to use it and not only for the pleasure of making himself guilty of a felony. Finally, the prosecution asserted that Mr. Banano's fingerprints were also found on gasoline tanks that were left near the sidecar. The existence of such tanks bearing my client's fingerprints does not surprise me. Imagine you have stolen a car. To drive it, you need gasoline, of course. But would you appear with a stolen vehicle in one of the most camera-equipped places on Earth, petrol stations? No, you wouldn't. You would only fill tanks. So, your honors, the, these are the only pieces of evidence the CPS has against my client. He stole a sidecar almost three months prior to the, to the murder, and his fingerprints were found on gasoline tanks. They are accusing him of being the gunman, thus charging him with conspiracy to murder, but no one saw him on the crime scene. No one saw him driving on the sidecar after the murder happened. No fingerprints were found on any murder weapon and no gun was found in or around his house. Nevertheless, conspiracy to murder is broader than the commission of the crime itself. Based on the provisions of Section 1 of the Criminal Law Act of 1977, conspiracy to murder is established when a person agrees with others that an act of murder shall be pursued, which, if the agreement is carried out in accordance with their intentions, will amount to the commission of the murder by one or more of the parties to the agreement. It is important to note how much this article emphasizes the necessity to prove the existence of mentoria, that is to say a guilty mind, in order to, research, in order to retain such an offense. In this case, Mr. Bonanno was not identified as a gunman. Even if there is a connection between my client and the sidecar, the prosecution cannot prove that he had any idea that he was contributing in one way or another to the criminal act. It is only a presumption, which is not enough to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. May I remind you that the burden of proof is on the prosecution? I do not have to prove that my client is not guilty. It is up to the prosecution to prove the contrary, and they have failed to do so. Now that we have ruled out the count of conspiracy to murder, let us focus on the count of participation in the activities of an organized crime group. Here we have two hypotheses. In the first one, my client burned the sidecar, thereby de destroying evidence and supposedly helping the organized crime group. In the second one, my client did not burn it. Of course, I am not in accordance with the former, but I will develop it in order to show you that it is nonsense. If we place ourselves in the reasoning of the CPS, my client was part of an organized crime group and found it clever to park the vehicle used in the crime next to his house. The next day, in order to destroy incriminating evidence, he decides to burn the sidecar, but without having the idea to, of moving it to a deserted place. No, he prefers to burn it next to his house. Of course, we all know that organized crime group hates being discreet. Come on. On top of that, he leaves gasoline tanks covered in his fingerprints next to the sidecar. 
That doesn't make any sense. These are beginner's mistakes. Instead of destroying evidence, he creates new and even clearer ones. Do you honestly believe that an organized crime group would allow that kind of mistake to happen? Would they take the risk of being discovered and disbanded? You now understand why this is nonsense, why this cannot have happened. Therefore, my client did not burn the sidecar. I rather believe that actual members of the organized crime group came to set the sidecar on fire and did everything in their power to constitute false incriminating evidence against my client in order to keep the organization safe. After all, there is a reason why these groups are called organized. According to Section 45 of the Serious Crime Act of 2015, a person participates in the criminal activities of an organized crime group. If the person takes part in the activities that the person knows or reasonably suspects are criminal activities of an organized crime group or will help an organized crime group to carry on criminal activities. We are now facing several possibilities. Either my client stole a sidecar and then got it stolen by the, by the organized crime group, therefore not meaning to help them, or he stole the sidecar, then lent it to the organized crime group, thus helping them, or he stole the sidecar with the purpose of helping the organized crime group. Let us analyze the two last possibilities to show that they are not plausible. The act of stealing the sidecar with the purpose of helping the organized crime group sounds somewhat unrealistic. It is not very smart to steal the vehicle three months prior to the date is needed, since it increases the risk of getting caught by the police. However, for both acts to enter the scope of the offense, the defendant must have acted with the intent of helping to commit their criminal activity. The fundamental basis of criminal law is mens rea, the guilty mind, added to actus reus, the guilty act. It is a matter of principle. As an example, a very similar case was decided by the Criminal Division of the Court of Appeal in June 2019. In this case, a car was stolen. They used it in a gang-related shooting by an organized crime group, after which the appellants had fired to and destroyed the car to impede the police investigation. In this decision, at paragraph 17 and 28, the judge emphasizes the awareness of the appellant of the crime committed by the organized crime group. This state of awareness is the basis for his decision to consider the appellant guilty and therefore dismiss the appeal. But in the case we are dealing with here today, just like for the count of conspiracy to murder, the prosecution has not proven the existence of mens rea. Therefore, the offense cannot be retained on these grounds. Everything is clearly circumstantial. Besides, as we all know, the standard of proof in this case is beyond reasonable doubt. That is to say that if there is any doubt about the guilt, it must always benefit the defendant. Members of the jury, we have explored all the hypotheses available and none of them enables the CPS to prove that my client is guilty beyond reasonable doubt, neither of conspiracy to murder nor of participation in the activities of an organized crime group. Considering this, I am sure you shall find Mr. Ronnie Bonanno not guilty. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Ramondou. Um, does the jury have questions for Mrs. Priard? Uh, Mr. Legal, I can see you have questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just one. Quick question, uh, just to make sure I understood your case correctly, and of course tell me if I'm wrong, but I think your case is based on the premise, uh, and I think it's on page one of your bundle, that uh, Mr. Freezer and Mr. Bonanno had the intention, you said, to murder Mr. Cornell when they drove to meet him armed with a gun. Uh, is that right? I think that's your case. Yeah. Uh, but even on that, on that case, do you accept that there would be a possibility that uh, Mr. Bonanno and uh, Mr. Freezer just decided to drive to the pub and only meet with Mr. Cornell. Your Lordship, thank you for raising this point. My, my case is that Ronnie Bonanno's presence at the time of the incident indicates that he, he committed a conspiracy to murder Mr. Cornell. But I agree, I understand your point. It is a possibility. 
said Mr. Benanu and Mr. Fraser, drove to the Blind Megal Hotel to meet with Mr. Cornell. However, the coincidence of time and place is highly, highly difficult to believe for me. So, so if I may just have one follow-up question, because I think you, uh, you, you did say during your uh, eloquence presentation that uh, there was, you said, um, an agreement uh, to kill Mr. Cornell, uh, so between Mr. Uh, Freezer and Mr. Bonanno, but um, how do you reconcile your case with the fact that Mr. Um, Freezer did not designate Mr. Bonanno as the, um, the gunman? Thank you for your question. I would say that we're talking about criminal organizations and we do not know how things are working in gangs. Maybe Mr. Fraser didn't want to to sell, to seal to uh, to give the name of uh, Mr. Bonanno because it's in the code of the gang and yeah, I would say that it doesn't prove the fact that Mr. Bonanno didn't go to the Blind Miguel Tavern at the time Mr. Cornell was murdered. And that Mr. Freezer, Mr. Bonanno, if he is the unidentified gunman, went there because it was a previous incident between the respective criminal organizations. So they have a motive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do the jury have uh, another question for Mrs. Priar, or should we move on to Mrs. Uh, Ramondou? I cannot see. Don't think we have any. I think Vivian, did you have a question, Vivian? Not necessarily for her. Maybe for either. It was concerning the conspiracy uh, to murder and mens rea. Um, isn't the agreement, uh, if you enter into an agreement, um, a conspiracy a agreement to commit an offense, isn't that uh, sufficient? And do you have to show um, intention for each of the participants in the conspiracy? Because uh, all the participants in the conspiracy don't necessarily go ahead and uh, complete, uh, pursue the course of conduct which leads to the uh, commission of the offence. So if you can, either of you can clarify uh, what you Thank understand. You, ladyship. Uh, I agree. Um, the, the agreement is at the heart of the conspiracy of murder. Um, Mr. Bonanno and Mr. Freezer agreed to commit the conspiracy to, Mr. to murder Mr. Cornell. And then for the men's right, therefore, they only have to show an intention to play some role in the conspiracy to murder Mr. Cornell. It is sufficient. Thank you. So now we will move on to questions to, to what uh, Mrs. Ramondou. Does the jury has any questions for uh, Mr. Forrester? Ms. Ramondou, in your pleading, uh, you uh, argued um, quite a bit that it would be foolish for your client, for a criminal, to act in this manner, burning the sidecar beside his house, that would be foolish. Um, isn't it reasonable for the court to consider that crimes are often committed by incompetent criminals who don't think through consequences of their actions? Putting it differently. Um, my theory is that if this, if the, um, Mr. Bonanno is part of an organized crime group, then he must have support and sort of an organization to commit the crime. And such foolish acts should not happen in that in um, in such circumstances. Thank you. Do we have another question for Mrs. Ramondou? Can I ask one? Yeah, sure. 
If the Crown establish that your client was the second man and therefore the gunman and is a member of an organised crime group, is that not sufficient? Um, we must prove on top of that, that he had the intent of killing uh, Mr. Cornell. I... If, it, if it's proven that he's the gunman, then that shows that he had the intent because he did it. He killed him. I think so. All right, um, so I'm gonna take it from here. Uh, do the jury has another question or should, should we move on to the deliberation? I don't see anyone wanted to ask a question. All right, so thank you very much for all your pleas. It was really interesting and you were very uh, interesting. And so uh, we are going to move the jury to a breakout room so they can deliberate and uh, and tell us uh, who the winner is for the first edition of uh, this multi competition. So, hey, we are back uh, to uh, our last meeting competition. I think that the jury uh, is uh, ready to give out the names uh, of our winners, uh, if uh, a jury could say them, they don't mind. Yeah, uh, I've been asked to announce the decision, Beatrice, uh, and I, I should say, as everyone will realise from the length of time it has taken us to reach a decision, we have found this a very, very difficult task, uh, an almost impossibly difficult task, because the, the standard of the performances was, was very high across the board, uh, and uh, we, we felt that everyone put in a, a very good performance indeed. Unfortunately, there has to be a loser and there has to be a winner, and we have reached a decision. In relation to the first year competition, the winner is Nicoletta Constantetlou. In relation to the second year uh, competition, the winner is Clara Priard. Congratulations to the winners, but also congratulations to the runners up. Uh, and I use the term runners up carefully rather than losers because you're definitely not losers. It's clear that there's great potential uh, amongst the, the, the mooters uh, that we heard from. Um, we thought perhaps it would help for the future if we gave some general tips, just a few to take forward with you as to the things that um, you can't speak too slowly, um, to focus on your best points if time is limited and to apply care to your bundles. So thank you all very much indeed. I'm good. To I'm going to hand over to Ian Forrester now as the president of the Franco British Lawyers Society. Well, um, greetings to you all. I think the internet connection is a bit unstable. So uh, I'll just make a couple of points and hope that you can hear me. First of all, this has been a great pleasure. Uh, oops. I um, I sit in I sat said lay in court um, and often had to slow people down, ask them to focus on the essentials, and it was uh, great great fun to hear excellent advocates debating uh, today. And um, I just want to encourage those of you who are not yet members of our distinguished association 
uh, to join. Conditions for being uh, a student member are very attractive and we have super events. We have had um, uh, events on matrimonial law. That may not sound so exciting. We had a big event uh, last year on droit des animaux, and that was absolutely extraordinarily rich. We have had every two years um, interrupted last year because of the pandemic, um, cooperative discussions about maritime cooperation between the British and French navies in the channel. Very, very interesting, unusual topics, which are off the, off the track of typical commercial conferences. And we also have excellent uh, sessions on career planning. And I know very well at this time that um, finding careers for law students is no easy matter. And so I think that you will have, if you join and participate, you can have fun, you can learn things, and maybe we can help you to identify a route to a decent paying job, or if it's not paying very much, uh, certainly an exciting one. Um, so thanks for sacrificing your Saturday afternoon. Thanks to the Mooters for sacrificing lots and lots of time devoted to preparing the bundles and getting ready for the advocacy today. And uh, hope to see you all soon. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Forrester. So now I'm just going to have a few words, a few concluding words. Um, I just wanted to say congratulations to all talented finalists who, even though they didn't win, uh, were more than, more than lived up to our expectation and gave amazing performances. Um, a special uh, congratulations go to, uh, of course, to Nicoleta Constantelou and Clara Priya, uh, who are the first, uh, first and second year winners of this first edition of Horace Moutin Competition. You have honored this, for, this first uh, edition and we thank you so much on behalf of all the uh, Horace uh, uh, Moutin Competition organizing team and we uh, offer you our warmest congratulations, which are more than deserved. To all the participants in the competition, we'd like to sincerely thank, thank you for following us in this adventure that has just begun. Thank you to our audience as well for coming in such a large number today on a Saturday afternoon and um, for supporting our young talents com coming from different double degrees. We also like to give a special thing to our honorable jury for having taken the precious time to keep uh, to come and judge the final of our meeting competition. And I just mostly want to also hugely thank my organizing team, uh, hence uh, Nicolas Ducom, Lola Rivard, and Alice uh, Engran for supporting me during this whole ride and for helping me in its organization. It surely wouldn't work as well as it did today without the help. Of course, I'd like to uh, thank Frédéric Goldman, who gave me his blind trust and precious advice for the elaboration of both panel for, uh, of the competition. There is nothing more incredible than to see an idea that came up from a small bedroom during the first French lockdown become reality. So thank you very much all for your trust and support. And uh, I would say that's it for me today. Have a nice day and don't hesitate to join us in social media, uh, on our social media accounts on Instagram and LinkedIn to keep up with uh, the competition. And I would say, see you next year. Uh, and let's do a bit of teasing, shall we? Next year, the competition uh, will be open to third year students. So it's going to be really exciting and we cannot wait to see uh, all of you uh, next year. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice day.